There's history here. And here. There's history there. History is everywhere. Okay, so the first phase was the search for political identity. Political identity. It is the briefest of the three, beginning in 1852 with the very first proposal for a new state and ending with the Civil War. This first proposed political entity <clears throat> definitely would have included much of Northern California and very probably, this very first one, some of adjacent Oregon as well. <clears throat> Why? After all, California had entered the state excuse me, entered the Union as a state only two years before. And it had entered the Union without going through that kind of purgatory of being a federal territory. It went straight from military government after the conquest by the U.S. troops during the Mexican War into being a state. <clears throat> Oregon still remained a federal territory, one that included, besides just the present state of Oregon, the entire rest of the Pacific Northwest, Washington, Idaho, most of western Montana, a little bit of Wyoming. <laughs> By 1850-51, following close upon the initial gold rush to the canyons of the central Sierras, rich new diggings were discovered ever further to the north and northwest, as far away from the original motherload country as the remote canyons of the lower Klamath River. <clears throat> and in 1851-52, prospectors found gold even further north in the Oregon Territory's Rogue River country. The resulting overnight, virtually overnight influx of miners, merchants, and farmers into our area <clears throat> formed what some new residents uh, believed had reached a critical mass of potential political power in northernmost California. That is, voters, most of them minors, <clears throat> had now become sufficient in numbers, living in a region that appear, appeared sufficiently large and wealthy, and one located more than sufficiently distant from Sacramento to justify creation of a new state. Thus it was in 1852 that some local politicians floated such a proposal in the Sacramento legislature. It would have created a new state of Shasta, <clears throat> encompassing the uppermost Sacramento Valley and the rest of California to the north. The attempt failed, only to succeed by another in 1853-54 for a state of Klamath, and this one definitely would have extended north to include an adjacent piece of the Oregon Territory. <coughs> There was a convention drawing delegates from the Upper Sacramento, Trinity, Klamath, Rogue, and Umpqua River drainages to discuss the proposed new state of Klamath. And that was held right here in Jackson County, in Jacksonville, <clears throat> in 1854. As we know, this effort, too, came to naught. Legislators from elsewhere saw to it that northernmost California would remain an economic hinterland of the Golden State and that the southwestern chunk of Oregon Territory stayed part of Oregon. So, as southwestern Oregon steadily filled with settlers during the mid-1850s, politically ambitious men, lawyers for the most part, flocked like hungry ravens. I love that phrase. Uh, <laughs> Uh, to Jacksonville. <clears throat> Among them, any lawyers here? Don't raise your hand, I'm sorry. Okay. Among them was William Green Tivalt. Formerly I thought it was pronounced Tivo. It's, that's the spelling you see there. That's him. But I've since learned it was uh, Americanized, not said the French way that I would have said it, having learned French poorly. Uh, a Tennessean who'd arrived in the Rogue River Valley during the gold rush, Tivault stayed. Hanging out his shingle as an attorney, Tivault also began Southern Oregon's first newspaper, using it to promote his extreme pro-Southern, pro-slavery states' rights views, as well as to launch his political career. In 1857, 
Tavolt and like-minded pro-slavery politicos living south of the Willamette Valley, and there were a number, not a huge number, but there were a number of them and quite prominent, proposed creation of a new federal territory out of the southern half of Oregon Territory, <clears throat> one to be named the Territory of Jackson, and unlike Oregon Territory, to be open to slavery. <clears throat> this idea was met with scorn and disapproval elsewhere in Oregon, and it's probable, I think, that very few of uh, t uh local supporters actually wanted to live in the, the slave society that he had envisioned. <clears throat> Nevertheless, the forceful t was elected to the territorial legislature in 1858 and soon became Speaker of the House. Oregon politics is very, very different back in that day than it became. Now, I'm uncertain if his scheme was originally intended to incorporate northernmost California into Jackson Territory's borders. But if that idea of his had been able to gain political traction, <clears throat> it very well could have. In fact, during the American Civil War, the irrepressible t was one of those who encouraged secession of the entire West Coast from the United States to form a slave-holding Pacific Republic, a second confederacy. He was quite vocal about this in his newspaper until the federal authorities shut it down. Following the end of the Civil War, very few murmurs were heard about forming a new state out of the region encompassing, <clears throat> the Northern, Cal uh, encompassing Northern California and Southwestern Oregon. With the arrival of the telegraph in the 1860s and of the railroad in the 1870s and 1880s, those two areas became ever more firmly, politically, and economically embedded in their respective states. <clears throat> so what of this first phase, the first of three phases? Because of very real remoteness from the distant capitals, this period produced quite sincere proposals for a new state. <clears throat> if there ever really was to be a separate state of Shasta, Klamath, Jackson, Siskiyou, or Jefferson, it was during this first phase when such a proposal most likely could have succeeded. Politically, prior to the Civil War, the entire Far West <clears throat> was a place where boundaries, whether those were physical, political boundaries on the map, and ground or mental boundaries in the ways of people's thinking, those remain fluid, that is still in flux, as yet undetermined. <clears throat> and it was not uh, coincidentally that the nation's only two successful instances of the separation of one part of a state into a new state happened in the years before the Civil War. Maine from Massachusetts in 1820 as part of the Missouri Compromise, which is done over the issue of slavery and the extension of slavery into the accumulating western territories at that time, the Louisiana Purchase. <clears throat> and West Virginia from Virginia in 1863 during the Civil War, the whole issue of slavery, okay? <laughs> not states' rights in of itself, I'm sorry, it was not, it was <laughs> slavery. And the leaders of the Confederacy said so time and time and again as they proclaimed their secession. But uh, West Virginia was able to be formed because Virginia was in rebellion. It was, its government was unrecognized, and the people of West Virginia did not want to secede from the Union. So that was a time where those two things happened, never since then. So now the second phase. And this was a search for political attention. <clears throat> It began shortly after the turn of the century during our region's second major economic boom time, the 1850s gold rush being the first, <clears throat> and with a minor exception that occurred in the mid-1950s, this phase basically ended with the nation's entry into World War II. By the first decade of the 20th century, the railroad had brought thousands of new arrivals into our region many of them lured here by slick promotional brochures touting our tremendous agricultural and commercial possibilities. This was the time of big new gold and especially copper mining ventures, of large-scale irrigation developments, 
of the Rogue Valley's consequent fruit orchard boom and of steadily increasing prices for real estate. And it was also the beginning of our commercial-sized uh, timber industry. <laughs> During the early 20th century, however, the more populated and distant parts of the two neighbor states still wielded by far most of the political power in Salem and Sacramento. Our own region's resentments grew, especially over the less than accurate perception that those far off places hogged far more than their fair share of tax expenditures. In 1909 and 1910, rather than float a potentially viable and realistic idea of secession, as had occurred in the 1850s, local boosters, often commercial club, chamber of commerce types who were kind of by nature prone to enthusiastic exaggeration, proposed forming a state of Siskiyou from several contiguous Northern California and Southwestern Oregon counties. Here again was a would-be political unit that schemed to incorporate adjacent parts of California and Oregon. However, this state of Siskiyou was not a serious secession proposal. You need to underline that. It was a bid for attention and a bid to have more people come. Accompanied by prominent coverage in Western newspapers, the idea was launched as a way to bring even more publicity to our then booming region. The state of Siskiyou was promoted as a place of tremendous natural resource wealth. In addition, the Siskiyou idea was used to amplify local complaints about the two states' allegedly inadequate expenditure on local road construction here, especially a paid Pacific Highway connecting the isolated region to Portland and the Bay Area, as well as new gravel surface roads to Crater Lake National Park and down the Klamath River Canyon. Interestingly, one Jackson County man who fully supported the secession campaign, one C.H. Clum, urged that the new state's name be changed from Siskiyou to Jefferson, thinking that the hallowed founding father's name would, could garner even wider national publicity than would the name Siskiyou. I think he might have also suggested it because he thought it would be far more pronounceable. Um, <laughs> especially to outsiders. <clears throat> However, <clears throat> I remember when I first read the word Siskiyou, you know, Siskiyou, or you know, what, what is that word? I've never heard of it. However, Siskiyou's Jackson County proponents <clears throat> retained the original name, perhaps in part, to cement their cross-border secession alliance with residents of huge Siskiyou County, California just over the Siskiyou summit here. By 1920, the North-South Pacific Highway, the new Pacific Highway as it was called then, now known as the old Pacific Highway, or old 99, <clears throat> had essentially been completed through our region. It was by far the most expensive per mile stretch of that lengthy road to be built. The tongue-in-cheek Siskiyou secession idea faded from popular memory. Our region's transportation infrastructure grew during the relatively prosperous times of the late teens, the 1920s, and it grew even more during the Great Depression, thanks to generous amounts of New Deal federal dollars for road construction and other projects. The 1909-1910 Siskiyou proposal had been nothing more than a publicity gimmick, one specifically geared towards bringing public attention to the region's bounty and governmental attention to the need for better roads. The state of Siskiyou concept, not unsurprisingly, formed the template for the second phase's far more successful secession attempt, that is successful in terms of gaining attention, the one of 1941. Background of that episode, probably known to many of you, um, late 1941, uh, World War II raging elsewhere, America's national defense spending climbing through the roof, but this area is still feeling it just did not have enough road and other infrastructure. The area feeling ignored and left out it was time for another attention getting tantrum. <laughs> <clears throat> 
The State of Jefferson episode came about in large part due to the action of Gilbert Gable, mayor of tiny Port Orford, Oregon, but who was also a nationally known railroad investor, promoter, and a radio personality. <clears throat> it was also due to the efforts of young, at that time, Randolph Collier on the right, uh, newly elected, uh, at that point, Democrat, later he switched over to the Republicans, his, his area became ever more conservative after, long after the New Deal in the 1950s. Um, he was state representative from Francisco County, the longest serving legislator in, in Sacramento, and he became known as the father of the California freeway system. He was a very influential man because he served for so long and had such seniority. The fellow in the middle there is a county judge, kind of like head of the county commissioners of Del Norte County in Siskiyou County at the time. John Childs, who later, be, who soon was to become the appointed governor of the state of Jefferson. And third, the third fellow, probably just as if not more important than the other two, <clears throat> was Stanton Delaplane. And if you remember reading Delaplane's uh, columns in the San Francisco Chronicle back in the 60s and 70s, well, Delaplane was in 1941 a reporter for the San Francisco Chronicle, whose editor, having heard about this rumblings of the secession movement up north, whose editor evidently knew a good story when he smelled one. <clears throat> and so Delaplane similarly played a very key role. <clears throat> Delaplane's probably most famous for uh, being the supposed uh, bringer of Irish coffee to the United States, uh, whiskey-laced coffee to the Buena Vista bar in San Francisco. Uh, but he actually earned a, a Pulitzer Prize for his story on the state of Jefferson, not the Pulitzer <laughs> Committee's finest moment. Uh, in his recollections, Della Plain recalled how it was him who suggested and guided the local 1941 secessionists publicity stunts from the filmed Roadblock on the Pacific Highway. Oh, by the way, the, the symbol was a double X, a uh, double cross on the bottom of a gold pan. So the Roadblock on Pacific Highway to the parade of a throng of sign-carrying Jeffersonians through downtown Lyrica, a parade in which, by the way, the marcher's placards featured the face, hand-drawn but very recognizable, of our country's third president, not that of Jefferson Davis. The rebel, a true secessionist, and a traitor. Um, sorry, any neo-Confederates here, but that's my opinion. Uh, suggestions that Jeff Davis was the movement's namesake are without any merit. He, his name does appear in a brass plaque down near Hilt on the Old Pacific Highway, but it was put there not as part of this 1941 movement. It was put there by the, daughter, the United Daughters of the Confederacy who wanted to you know, honor their, their great president. Anyhow, uh, the, uh, those, both those events uh, that I just mentioned were staged specifically for national newsreel cameras. Gable and Collier proposed to county commissioners of all adjacent counties of California and Oregon, including Jackson and Josephine counties, that they join to establish the new state of Jefferson. Among other suggested names were the state of Middle West Costia <laughs> and the state of Del Curiscu. <laughs> Talk about pronunciation. That was after the three original counties, Del Norte, Curry, and uh, Siskiyou. And my favorite, the state of discontent, because that pretty much <laughs> says it all. The secession movement took shape during November 1941. <clears throat> and it, uh, we're playing up the resentments of uh, uh, residents uh, uh, had towards faithless Sacramento and Salem. 
and uh, Delaplane did a masterful job. And he, in his stories, he definitely gilded the lily. In fact, he was that was his reputation on the Chronicle for years. You can't take what Delaplane says as fact, as gospel. He invents, he exaggerates. So, okay. Um, among the several proposed tongue-in-cheek uh, state mottos was our roads are not passable, they're hardly jackassable. <clears throat> and proponents affirmed that the new state would secede every other Thursday until further notice. <clears throat> A governor was elected, John Childs, actually who was selected, <clears throat> and Wairika was declared the capital. <clears throat> The soon-to-become-famous 1941 roadblock <clears throat> on the Pacific Highway just outside Wairika with those armed Stetson-wearing Jeffersonians <clears throat> passing out the new state's declaration of secession to passing motorists that gained national coverage, including New York Times. Okay, so the main energy for this movement came from business people and politicians in Curry County, Oregon, and in Siskiyou and Del Norte counties in California, <clears throat> but with pleas for their immediate neighbors to uh, join the effort. Now, this is a little off color, but uh, I'm going to say it anyway. Uh, however, not just any county. It, I think it reveals what, was, what this movement was like at the time, how serious it really was. That's why I include it. However, not just any county was considered suitable for admission. Some were thought to be located too far afield and thus might dilute the impact of the publicity. <clears throat> when representatives of California's Lassen County first asked to join, one Siskiyou County official in a bit of Jeffersonian vulgarity publicly sent a bottle of cod liver oil to Lassen County with the advice, go start your own movement. So, as we know, as we know, far more significant events than this intervened the day before the Jeffersonian scheduled publicity extravaganza to be held on December 8, 1941. And so, the war came, and we won. And then came that great post-war economic boom, including the baby boom and the housing boom, that created the vibrant timber-based economy of our region, and that gave respite between the second and third phases of our region's search for identity. Not too many one log loads seen anymore. <clears throat> Alas, in 1956, and still feeling le left out of the post-war boom, Curry County residents, particularly Brookings, loggers, and mill workers, did protest the poor conditions of the Coast Highway, Highway 101. They demanded faster and safer transport of logs to the mill, and a Brookings made lumber to railheads situated well to the north and south. Simply another attention-getting campaign, obviously modeled on the 1941 episode, their proposed 49th state of Shasta was not to be. But ironically, although their gimmick was swept away by world events, the 1941 Jeffersonians' ultimate hopes of massive natural resource development indeed did come to pass after the war. The four prosperous decades between the early 1950s and the late 1980s brought thousands of miles <clears throat> of new logging roads into heretofore roadless country. Roads used by log trucks coming one after another down from the forest to the proliferating new sawmills and plywood mills that, working double and sometimes even triple shifts, now produced for an insatiable national market. <clears throat> so, in the long run, the market needs of the post-war boom succeeded beyond those 1941 Jeffersonians' wildest pre-war dreams. Federal and state infrastructure dollars came pouring into our region. Ironically, perhaps, it was, I believe, largely as a consequence of those wonderful post-war boom years that our third phase of search began. 
That search is ongoing still. <clears throat> it's what I'd call a contested search for a true regional identity. Think of it now, okay? Search for one's identity. That can often be taken as a sense of someone's uncertainty, uh, anxiety. It's often undertaken by adolescents, young adults. Um, I think at least metaphorically, that's been the case with this current third phase, phase in our area of search, anxiety. When, as a young man in the late 1960s, I first came to Rogue River Valley from the East Coast, yep, searching for my identity, <laughs> I'd never heard of the 1941 State of Jefferson movement. Never heard of it. And more importantly, I think, unlike today, at the time that I did arrive here, that story was not nearly as widely known and prominent in local popular consciousness as it has become in more recent years. It was known, but not anything like today. Why would that be? Continuing on through the end of America's phenomenal post-war economic boom in the 1980s, our region enjoyed a rocking, accelerating ride of logging huge quantities of federal timber. The mills remained incredibly busy, and the Southern Pacific Railroads, back when it still ran through here, the railroads' trains pulled out of Medford every few days filled with lumber, plywood, and bins of pears. People set their watches by the lunchtime whistle of the now-vanished Medford Corporation's big sawmill at the north end of town, audible from one end of town to the other. And I set my watch when I worked in Medford uh, by that whistle. <clears throat> Here, in what may, we might call northern Jefferson, meaning southwestern Oregon, National Forest and Bureau of Land Management's ONC, Oregon California Railroad Grant lands, don't have time to explain it, those timber harvest dollars from those federal lands, big portions of those dollars poured into the county coffers, building new roads, justice centers, jails, parks, and roads, <clears throat> as well by the mid to late 1970s began yet another very large and continuing influx of newcomers arriving from elsewhere. The Bay Area, Southern California, Portland, Puget Sound, people like me from back east, simultaneously began a greatly expanding arrival from Mexico and elsewhere. Alas, economic success can often bring its own set of new problems, perceived or real, <clears throat> and its own new worries. For some residents of our region, especially newcomers, it was a worry about the rate and amount of our area's commodification of natural resources from the mountains, specifically logging of old growth timber, <clears throat> as well as worry about the pace of development down the valleys. I think it was this anxiety that contributed greatly to the development of an emerging regional consciousness, a sense of our area's specialness. This post-1970s search for a usable regional identity fairly naturally, if opportunistically, took over the old state of Jefferson name as a means of increasing the growing consciousness of a unique bioregion. Environmental activists and others utilize the phrase state of Jefferson as a way to highlight the region's undeniable biological diversity and aesthetic values. However, for others, some of them, also relative newcomers, <clears throat> but who might have come here mainly for the low tax rates and simply to be left the hell alone, but the state of Jefferson identity became their badge as supposedly self-reliant rebels, fixated on their own personal property rights in their own little patch of heaven. It is this mindset that in 2013, prompted the recent unsuccessful effort by some Southern Jeffersonians, meaning down in California, to kind of tea party there where it is secession. This time, it was a serious, if in my opinion, utterly self-deluded attempt at separation. This sentiment has often been mixed with wildly overblown fears of what some people perceived as encroaching state and federal takeover from black helicopters to who knows what. Ironically, here in southwestern Oregon, especially the, 
the lure of low property taxes, some of these people remain loath to admit, has been and had been largely courtesy of the federal government's incredibly generous federal timber receipts sharing formula <coughs> uh, for the counties. <coughs> it was a formula, the so-called ONC formula as it's known, for sharing, giving back, not giving, but giving to counties a certain percentage of timber receipts from federal timber sales. It was a formula, one developed by big government <coughs> during the New Deal, that was far more generous than the standard federal timber receipt arrangements found in any other part of the American West. It's a gravy train. It's a sweetheart deal. And it came about during the political, legislative sausage making back in the late 1930s. And it's been the main job of any congressman from this district to take up his shield and sword and defend that formula and to say it's sacred. And so far, it's still there. But of course, with the incredibly dramatically uh, declining timber receipts, it doesn't do what it once did. <clears throat> On the other hand, I think that for many, <clears throat> even most residents, possibly including many of us here today, this third phase of State of Jefferson regional identity consciousness is far more subtle than either the bioregional or the local sovereignty approaches just mentioned. It appeals to us, perhaps, especially since the late 1970s, <clears throat> because our regions become less and less distinctive, less rural, more and more like every place else. We become more urban, more cosmopolitan, more dominated by the very same big box stores that popped up like mushrooms in the places some of us originally fled from. And I think it's that search for identity, a search born in part of newer residents' anxiety over what we are losing in terms of regional distinctiveness that has helped fuel this current phase. As well as, I think, if we're honest here, as well as some of us newcomers' possible desire to quickly put on the cloak, to don the mantle, if you will, of being a real live local as soon as possible. <laughs> Mind you, those uh, bumper stickers you used to see on the backs of cars back in the 80s, Oregon native since 1985. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> uh, it's an effort to claim personal ownership to the region, to put down self-comforting psychological roots in one's new home. One can conveniently put down such roots by reveling reveling in a bit of distinctive state of Jefferson, if not always fully understood or accurate regional history. Um, in closing, we must recall that we're not at all unique in this would-be secessionist history of ours. It's been a part of American history that stretches from the 1790s state of Franklin proposal, which would have combined western North Carolina with eastern Tennessee, on through the 1920s secession threat of northern Illinois, mainly Chicago, <coughs> from Illinois. It was the polar opposite of the state of Jefferson. It, erup it erupted from long-standing urban resentment <coughs> of rural control of that state's government. <coughs> it has continued into quite recent times, from sawing California into two or more pieces, to separation of New York City and Long Island from upstate New York, so perhaps our not-so-United States have seen at least two dozen secession or separation schemes of varying degrees of seriousness in the past few decades. Now let me close with a little bit of irony. Jackson County and Josephine County are the two places in our region that today make by far the most commercial and popular hoopla. By far the biggest you know, uproar out of the state of Jefferson, out of that secession story of 1941. It's commemorated by a number of recent or current institutional names from Jefferson State Bank, Jefferson State Plumbing, and Jefferson State Freight Company to Jefferson Public Radio, the state of Jefferson Rock Band, um, Medford's Jefferson Nature Center, and Josephine County's Jefferson 
State Music Festival and Hemp Expo. <laughs> <laughs> However, back in 1941, which two counties faint-hearted boards of commissioners? Counties located well within the originally proposed boundaries of the 1941 state of Jefferson got cold feet and refused to officially endorse the idea. Which two counties declined to bravely sign, sign on to the secession movement? Jackson and Josephine. Thank you. All right.